Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Rick Klein. I'm the president of Gardner Business Media. We are the producers of AutoBeat Daily and Automotive Design and Production Magazine. I'd like to welcome you all to our first annual Auto Mobility Conference at this beautiful facility. Um, it's my honor today to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. John J. Leonard from the Toyota Research Institute. John is the Director of Autonomy at the Toyota Research Institute and is the Samuel C. Collins Professor in the MIT Department of Mechanical Engineering. He is a member of the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. His research addresses the problems of navigation and mapping for autonomous mo mobile robots and underwater vehicles. He holds degrees from the University of Pennsylvania uh, and Oxford University and he is the team leader for MIT's DARPA Urban Challenge team, which was one of 11 teams to qualify for the Urban Challenge final event, and one of six teams to complete the race. At the Toyota Research Institute, Dr. Leonard is helping lead an effort to create the Guardian system for increasing the safety of human driving by exploiting advanced perception and navigation capabilities developed by the mobile robotics research community. There are index tables, I'm sorry, index cards on the tables if you have questions for Dr. Leonard, or you can feel free to come up to the microphone, which is somewhere in front of the stage here, um, to ask questions after he's finished. So, Dr. Leonard, thank you. Thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's really great uh, to be here. Um, in, in my talk, I want to um, give you a, sort of a perspective. I'm, I'm an MIT professor, but I've recently gone on an extended sabbatical uh, with uh, Toyota Research Institute, helping to create the new, um, uh, a, a new capability for, for, for autonomy uh, and robotics. And so in my, in my talk, I um, have a, a sort of sampling of some things that I've done as an MIT professor, and then some, some information about Toyota Research Institute and, and I have a, a lot of, uh, really just a, I've been obsessed with robots since I started as a graduate student in 1987 at the University of Oxford. And uh, shown here, if, if uh, the, um, I think this will work if I click, the, uh, the uh, on the left is our DARPA Urban Challenge vehicle in 2007. Uh, this was a race that, that DARPA organized that really, uh, if you look at what's happening today in autonomy and mobility, it's, I'm, I'm truly stunned. As someone who's really watched this area closely, uh, the rate of, of investment is, is just amazing and, and the progress. Um, and I think the DARPA Urban Challenge uh, was one of the, or the sequence of the DARPA Grand Challenges, uh, which uh, Stanford won the second one in 2005 and Carnegie Mellon won the last one in 2007. It's really, um, uh, it, it, those were sort of the seeds that were planted that have now grown to, to create this new industry. Um, on the right here, so that video is a, a bit old. On the right is a video just from this summer um, in, uh, in my MIT life uh, doing research to collect data. Uh, this is driving in the streets of Cambridge, and you can see the sort of the urban complexity, uh, crosswalks and lots of pedestrians, uh, trucks backing out, various sorts of tricky situations. And even though the field has made great progress, part of my message is that there, there still are tremendous research challenges to solve. So let me first start off by saying a little bit about TRI. And uh, so the, the um, so Toyota Research Institute was announced um, uh, uh, in, uh, about in November of last year, and I was pleased to join in, in January. Uh, and uh, our leader is Gil Pratt. I'll say a little bit more about Gil, Gil and his connection to DARPA, the DARPA challenges in a minute. We have three primary research, uh, research focus areas. Uh, number one, first and foremost, is automotive safety and advanced autonomy. Uh, number two is mobility, uh, both indoors and outdoors. Uh, and number three is uh, scientific discovery. And we have three locations, uh, our main headquarters in, in Palo Alto, and we have uh, labs here in Ann Arbor uh, and in Cambridge near MIT. And we've tried to stay very close to the University of Michigan, MIT, and Stanford campuses because part of our mission is to, is to um, connect with the universities and invest with them uh, and, and work together as partners to address some of these great challenges. And so just a quick TRI history. This is uh, Dr. Gil Pratt at the DARPA Robotics Challenge in June 2015. It's hard for me to believe this was only uh, 
about 16 months ago. Um, but in this challenge, the motivation was a disaster response scenario where, uh, motivated by the Fukushima disaster, what would it take to have robots that could actually go into an area that was too dangerous for people to do useful work? And, and so Gil was the program manager at DARPA that um, launched this amazing competition that led to uh, a, a real great progress in humanoid robotics. Now, I wasn't directly involved. I was a cheerleader for my colleagues at MIT. Um, but it, having gone through the DARPA Urban Challenge, which was a driving challenge, I sort of know how intense uh, and, and amazing those experiences can be. And so a short time later, I think Gil maybe would have deserved a sabbatical, but uh, soon after that, in, in November, almost coming up on our one-year anniversary, um, this is uh, Gil with Akio Toyota uh, announcing the launch of Toyota Research Institute, which uh, was a, uh, announced as a billion-dollar investment over five years. Um, and, and I kind of think of it, our mission as uh, those three goals I talked about, sort of safe uh, mobility for all is, is kind of my, my personal theme. And at CES this year, I had a, the great pleasure to be there with Gil as he announced our sort of uh, challenge. And, and Toyota vehicles, if you do a back of the envelope calculation, uh, if you see the, the, the rough order of magnitude of how long the vehicles are on the road, how many Toyota sells, uh, and, and, and how, many are, how the life length of service, uh, you wind up calculating that Toyota vehicles carry, travel about a trillion miles each year. And so that's the challenge that we have. And, and obviously, safety is a huge motivation. Uh, uh, traffic accidents are just a tragedy that I think we can address with technology. Uh, but the scale is, is just such a big problem. That's why I think we need the greatest um, research minds and capabilities. And that's why our university partnerships, for example, are so important to us. So at CES, um, they, we, our leadership was announced. And I was really thrilled to be part of the, part of the team on the stage. Uh, and I'll mention a few of our other um, sort of um, leaders, uh, in particular, um, uh, a couple of folks that really stand out. James Kuffner is our chief technology officer. He's in our California office. James was one of the original 10, uh, roughly, people that created the Google car. Uh, previously, he was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. He's famous as an academic roboticist for his uh, rapidly exploring random tree algorithm, which we used in our DARPA challenge team. Uh, and after the Google car, he, he led efforts in robotics at Google. And so he's uh, credited with coining the phrase cloud robotics, and the notion that a robot can have connection to the cloud. Uh, if one ro robot recognizes a, a Coke can, all robots should be able to recognize a Coke can. And so that cloud uh, intelligence is one of the great motivators in, in, our, in, in our approach. Um, also joining us in the leadership, my, my MIT colleague Russ Tedrake was the team leader for the MIT DARPA Robotics Challenge team. And Russ uh, used uh, a robot called an Atlas, built by Boston Dynamics, who's one of six teams that were given that robot by the government. And they developed highly advanced capabilities using simulation uh, and online verification and optimization, optimization techniques so that a robot could um, uh, execute very complex tasks uh, sort of semi-autonomously. So an operator would just say, open the door, and the robot would plan its motions to open the door. And it's this sort of capabilities in walking, in manipulation, and interaction lead us to believe that we genuinely can uh, make a difference in robotics, and that, and that we can build robots for the home that can help people. And, and that's one of TRI's long-term missions. And that, that could be sort of viewed as part of the potential of Toyota's future. And so we have this, uh, I'm just really uh, so amazed and, and uh, thrilled at the opportunity to help Toyota define its long-term future, which we think can involve uh, big investments in robotics. So part of Russ's sort of group is this, this software infrastructure. So modern machines run on data. And it's the data and algorithms and learning, uh, and then trying to do that in a way that's verifiable and robust that, that motivate our research. So, it's the software culture of advanced robotics that we want to try to bring to the auto industry. And um, so Russ is helping with our robotics efforts and our simulation efforts for driving. Uh, two other leaders, which happen to be former students of mine from MIT, are professors Ryan Eustace and Ed Olson uh, from the University of Michigan. Uh, they are co-directing our autonomous driving development efforts here uh, at, at the Ann Arbor office. So with that as some sort of a, a bit of an intro to Toyota Research Institute, 
Uh, it, since w my role there is relatively new, I started in January and, and came on board on sabbatical uh, in, in August and September. Uh, what I'd like to do in my talk is to give a little bit of a historical perspective uh, and then talk about, and, and that's really from the perspective of an MIT academic roboticist. And then I'm going to talk about challenges for autonomous driving, why I believe it, it, it is very hard, and we have to keep aware of the challenges. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, I'll, I'll, if time permitting at the end, I'll say a little bit about some of our future uh, vision and research opportunities at TRI. So just briefly, uh, my background, uh, I've, I've been very fortunate. I feel like the luckiest person in the world. The amazing people I've gotten to work with and the amazing robots I've gotten to work with. But I started in England with small robots trying to navigate in, in buildings where I wanted to use vision, uh, but the technology was just too primitive. And, and so I used ultrasonic sensors, which had uh, challenges, but still let us develop some of the early algorithms for robot mapping and navigation. And then uh, 25 years ago, last month, I moved to MIT to work on underwater robots. And that's been a lot of my career has been actually directed at underwater robots. But as an, uh, as an academic, I've focused on this problem known as SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, and an example of SLAM is the third image uh, from the left uh, up there, which is using vision or sonar or radar to build a map of an unknown environment as a robot moves through the, ma the map. And it turns out that SLAM is very important for self-driving cars because to navigate robots precisely, you need a map. But to build the map, you need to move and gather data from multiple vantage points, and your motion is uncertain. So the key challenge in, in SLAM is that uh, your dead reckoning has an error that grows, uh, and to, what you need to do is to concurrently map the world and estimate your position. And that turns out to be a sort of high dimensional, very complex inference problem. And so, so there's actually a, a strong research community all around the world, folks that work on, on these SLAM techniques, and it turns out to be part of the foundation of perception for a mobile robot. If you know your position very precisely, and this is how the Google car operates, by having a very accurate map and knowing their position very precisely in the map, they get to um, then predict what data they should see, and then it makes it easier to explain the unexpected data. So in my, in my career, I've moved around to different places at MIT, from ocean engineering to mechanical engineering to the AI lab to, to CSAIL. And, uh, and, but throughout that story, it's, it's how robots navigate and build maps has been the common theme. And in the underwater domain, I know this is an automotive conference, but the uh, Actually, building robots underwater is a great challenge because we can't communicate with them easily, uh, and it's very easy to lose them. And in fact, some of the, uh, the techniques that we develop underwater is a really great place to test them. In fact, some of the key members of the Google team, one of the key members of, members of the Google team today is actually an underwater roboticist, Nathaniel Fairfield. And so uh, underwater robots actually have some of the same challenges, and it's kind of fun. Now, uh, as a professor, I also teach, and, 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 and I love to teach, and, and just as a little uh, aside, does anyone here go to the University of Michigan? Any Michigan fans or any, any uh, alums? So um, I am a Philadelphia Eagles fan. I don't really like the Patriots, or, uh, uh, and, uh, but I, in my teaching, I got connected with Deflategate. And so I had an article in SI.com, uh, Sports Illustrated, two weeks ago, which was the first time I ever had a publication in a venue like that. But um, my analysis is that... Uh, there was no deflation, and I can prove it to you if you'll give me uh, 10 minutes and a few sheets of paper. But uh, so uh, that's another thing why I feel so lucky is the ability to contribute in education and to, and to do lots of different things. Um, but in education, more about robotics, at MIT, we, uh, I have some uh, amazing postdocs and collaborators that developed a course this uh, past spring. We called it Ducky Town. And the goal was to build a cheap, inexpensive robot that cost only $150, and let's see this plays. So this is a little video for our Ducky Town course. The goal is to make an open source educational experience where the software and the modules and the teaching materials are all made available online. And the, the idea is a, a reproducible course that, that is low cost, say, for uh, developing countries and places that um, where the budget it would be quite a restriction. And so what we did is we had 27 students, we had over 60 try to sign up, we restricted it to uh, a bit smaller, and it was 
the, each student built their own robot, and it has a small computer running Linux, it has a camera, it has a Wi-Fi connection, and the, the sort of uh, ambition was to create an autonomous sort of Uber system for the fictional town of Duckytown. And it was, um, and, and the amazing thing to me is that a lot of the challenges of, say, making a half million dollar self-driving car navigate, say, through the streets of Mountain View, uh, some of the same software challenges you can experience with a $150 robot. So that's, uh, um, ultimately, I think we're going to need our young people to invest in, in, in the software skills and the engineering skills to develop these systems if, if the full vision of autonomy is going to be realized. And so the educational piece is very important to us. Uh, so that's Ducky Town. So in fact, we set it up as a, as a sort of fake company on LinkedIn, so Ducky Town Engineering Company. And uh, it was, uh, these are the components of the robot. And so that, that's, we've come a long way in terms of cost reduction and miniaturization. And, and a lot of the challenges come in computer vision, and I'll, I'll come back to that a bit. Okay, so uh, I'm now gonna go back in time to 2007, 2006, to the DARPA Urban Challenge. And I'm gonna use it as an example to talk about the sort of challenges of autonomy. And then I'm gonna go forward and talk about some more recent uh, experiences. So in the Urban Challenge, our goal was to build a car that could drive 60 miles autonomously in traffic. And uh, let's see, the, uh, one second. Oh, that's not going to work. Uh, okay, so on the left here, this is uh, the data from a Velodyne laser scanner driving up Mass Ave from MIT to Harvard. Uh, it gives you about a million data points per second. And that data is, um, you know, obviously LIDAR, LIDAR is a very important sensor for these vehicles. LIDAR gives you direct range, uh, also intensity information, and and at least today, I think LiDAR is essential uh, for, for robust autonomy. But the aspiration is to move to try to use computer vision. And probably a bit ahead of our time, back in 2007, our vehicle tried to use vision to navigate, using vision to extract the curbs and the lane markings. It had to deal with looking into the sun. And so in the DARPA challenge race, our robot, uh, it, it built a local map. And in the upper right, you see the local path uh, local map the robot's building and a randomized motion plan or the algorithm due to James Kuffner that we used and adapted uh, that the robot uses to try to choose its path through the world in real time. We didn't want to blindly follow GPS because GPS has problems with tall buildings, uh, you know, maps, prior maps can be inaccurate. We wanted our robot to build the map on its own. And our vehicle, we called it Talos. Uh, it was a, a, a Land Rover donated to us by Ford, for which we're very grateful. Uh, we had a uh, blade cluster that had, my colleagues didn't want to be limited by computation. So our robot had 40 cores, which was a lot for the day. It took 3.5 kilowatts to power the computer. We had a two kilowatt air conditioner on the roof and we needed a six kilowatt RV genset in the back to power the whole thing. So that was uh, a little bit overboard, but we had more sensors than any other team. Uh, radars, lidars, and cameras, and we really wanted a perception-driven vehicle. And to make a very long story short, at the end of the day, we came in uh, fourth place. Uh, Carnegie Mellon were first, Stanford second, Virginia Tech third. Uh, those teams did a pretty uh, amazing job. Um, we, uh, because our vehicle was perception-driven versus prior maps, it was a little more uncertain of itself. We had a few little um, sort of incidents along the way. Let's see if this one has sound. Uh, I, this is kind of fun. This is an MIT thing, not a Toyota thing. If you can, if you can hear that, increase the volume a little. the line at the end of so, two behind Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech, Whoop, there we go, got a little issue. So the setup here is that we had been trying to pass Cornell for about five minutes. It was five hours into the six hour race. The, the 79 is trying to pass and has And they were just the stopping in the middle of the road and sta Skynet, starting and reversing. The 26 vehicle. Wow. And Talos. now he's going to, and Talos is going to pass. Very aggressive. And Whoa. Oh. <laughs> oh, we had our first collision. <laughs> Crash in turn one. Oh, boy. That is, you know, that's a bold maneuver <laughs> for uh, MIT. All right, so why do I show that? Well, um, the, the, uh, the technology we had nine years ago with LiDAR, this is an, a visualization inside the brain of the car. And even though we can see with our eyes in the camera imagery, there's a car, there's a road, um, now those problems are solved in vision, in terms of detecting vision, at least in good weather conditions. But back then, we only had a laser scanner, 
with the sort of car sitting still is just a blob of laser points. And it's actually hard to know if a stationary object is actually going to move. And um, so what we did, I mean, we're, we're, very much at, we're very much academics. We want the field to progress. We made all our data public. We actually traded our data logs with Cornell uh, and wrote a, a, a peer-reviewed journal article, like a sort of a 38-page peer-reviewed accident report about this and, all, and a few of the other incidents. And, and I think the lesson is that it's important to keep in mind that a robot is going to do what it's programmed to do. And uh, if uh, what we really need is the sort, of the, in, the sort of artificial intelligence to sort of have a scene understanding and a vehicle that knows what it knows and knows what it doesn't know. And, and the ability to sort of deal with the unexpected. To our robot, that stationary object moving was unexpected to it. Uh, and a few other things happened. But in terms of the research, our robot, this is another example, uh, illustration of our perception-driven navigation, where the robot didn't blindly follow GPS, but it tried to make its own map between very sparse waypoints. And so this is in a, what's called a, the national qualifying event uh, the, the, uh, for, for, for sparse waypoint navigation. So if, you, if uh, you contrast that with the approaches that Carnegie Mellon and Stanford took, they used very precise a priori maps telling the robot, in effect, exactly which path to follow. And then it could make only small deviations from that path. And in the, uh, in, uh, if you look today, so this is a, uh, a screenshot from a video, a vi screenshot of a Google video. I'm sure they wouldn't mind me showing it. Uh, it's sort of uh, uh, pretty uh, amazing the level of detail of the maps. So they use high definition HD maps to really map what the LiDAR, what the laser scanner is going to see for the world. This is an example in Mountain View, where with very accurate maps, you can locate the vehicle very precisely. And that precise uh, position information lets the robot have a much greater ability to predict what's expected and therefore deal with the unexpected better. Now, in, in the research community, and what we'd, what we'd really like to do is get more towards uh, less reliance on very accurate prior maps. Because what if the road is covered with snow? What if the, the world has changed substantially due to construction? And this is where the SLAM thing that I mentioned comes in. So shown here are some examples from my career, different examples of this SLAM problem. I mentioned that the error grows, the dead reckoning error grows. If you look in the upper, upper left, this is an example in the upper left from uh, a robot with a laser scanner at MIT navigating around the corridors. And you can see there's sort of this drift. The sort of map is a little bit messed up. And if you just watch the one in the upper left right now, it just did what we call loop closing, which is when you come back to a place you've been before, you can correct the error and correct your map. And the other videos are just other examples, like an early example with vision, a more recent visual example using dense mapping uh, with a connect how robots can build maps automatically and then use those maps to navigate. And that's one of the core technologies. And, and, and in a historical sense, I, I pulled a, an old video from when I was a grad student, and I used these little ultrasonic sonars on the side of a, a robot here. This is in the basement of the engineering lab at Oxford. Um, I would hand measure a map, and the robot would navigate relative to that. So if you know your map, you can estimate your position. But we were. Next to me at that computer is a box on the left of this early sun workstation. It did frame grabbing and, and edge detection at about three frames per second. That cost $100,000, 100,000 British pounds, actually. And, and when I was a student in 1988, now that same thing can be on our $150 ducky bot. And so the, the sort of commoditization of computer vision and the amazing computation we have makes it even feasible to think about doing much greater uh, things. Uh, but there still are these research challenges. And so I think about the problem space in terms of these different axes of difficulty about how do we represent the world, how do we do inference and learning, and then how do we build systems and make them robust. And at, at, at MIT, the kind of research that my students and I do, here's an example from one of my recent students. Um, his name's uh, Sudip Pillai. He's an amazing uh, student who's looking at how you combine object recognition with positioning, so that if you can uh, combine information from multiple vantage points as you move through the world, that you can uh, do, um, you can you can better recognize objects. And and in fact, if I like one aspiration for the field is is to have almost the equivalent of Google, uh, the ability for the physical world. So what would it take to be able to answer like search queries, like find me, uh, you know all of the glasses, or find me all the chairs, find me all the, uh, uh, 
construction cones, find me, like how do you answer sort of queries about the world and have a representation of the world that's more human like in terms of, in terms of objects. So some other MIT examples, um, one of the other recent uh, real game changers in robotics and vision is the ubiquitous availability of GPUs, the graphical processing units from NVIDIA and others. This is an example of an algorithm uh, developed with collaborators in Ireland in, um, uh, that my lab worked with where you can take a camera, a Kinect camera, and walk through an environment. This is a small apartment uh, in Ireland. And using a, a GPU, you can sort of create a dense 3D representation of the world that produces in real time really stunningly sort of accurate models. This is a few years old now. This example is from, I think, 2012. Gosh, so it's four years old now. But if I go to the next slide, you'll see uh, this is just a reconstruction of part of someone's apartment. You can see the level of detail, like the sink and the tub. And what, what we're enabling is the ability to get really rich 3D models of the world in real time and then feed that back uh, to control robots. And the next result I'm going to show is uh, how you can integrate this with perception and control. And this is my collaborators. I wasn't directly involved in this work. Uh, this is the robot I mentioned at the start, Professor Russ Tedrick with the DARPA Challenge Atlas robot. Uh, using that robot coupled with our dense 3D mapping system, and let's see if the videos play here, the top and the bottom. What the robot did is it used a real-time algorithm for, 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 for mapping the 3D terrain and then connected that back to the motion controller to be able to plan the footsteps. So these are the same experiments. The videos are just not synchronized. And so down on the bottom here, you can see the, the, the yellow and the green sort of projected target foot placements. Uh, the robot, with, with no a priori information, is planning its path through the world and, and doing autonomous climbing of stairs. So th this sort of capability to connect the vision, the 3D understanding of the world, back to the motion control, the robot, you know, makes me confident that we really can create robots that can be useful in the home, that can be safe and can be helpful, um, for example, for the elderly or for, uh, for, for folks that need uh, assistance at home. And, and that's some of the sort of broader vision of what we're looking at at TRI. So what I want to do now, and, and I'm, you know, I'm going to go fast, is um, challenges for autonomous driving. And, and I think that the potential benefits are, are quite amazing. You know, just safety alone, but also things like increasing the efficiency of the road network, changing the way cities are designed. Imagine all the space uh, used for parking to be somehow reclaimed. You can imagine new models of how personal people move and goods move uh, through, through the world. But there are a lot of questions. And myself, I think about them all. I'm really only an expert more on the technological side, but I think there are economic, employment, ethical, legal, security, energy, and the environment. There's a whole set of questions. And that's why I think this is just such a wonderful conference and a wonderful thing to start, because there, there's such a great discussion to be having here. Um, I've been had opportunities to talk about self-driving, the technology part uh, in the media. Uh, and the way I like to, to, to motivate this, um, I was interviewed a few years ago by MIT Tech Review. I realize that's way too many words to read. But uh, the, the title, Driverless Cars Are Further Away Than You Think. And I'll, and I'll confess, I've been somewhat of a skeptic, although my own time, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I see so much progress that I, it's hard to be quite as skeptical. But I think we have to be honest about the challenges. And uh, when this article came out, uh, and I was a, a little critical, there's something called Reddit, which I had never heard of in my life. Um, but there's a wonderful Reddit self-driving cars page. And uh, I had, didn't know this existed. I was Googling the article to send to my mom or something. And this, this came up, and, and someone had commented. They post the article and comment, MIT's John Leonard does not believe total autonomy is intimate. I do not expect to be taxis in Manhattan with no drivers in my lifetime. Talk about a Debbie Downer. He's not even 50 years old. Now I'm 51. Sounds more like someone that's afraid of the technology and has trust issues with machines. So, um, and, uh, so when this came out, I said, well, wait, I, all these sort of intuitive uh, worries I've had, maybe I need to make it a little more explicit. So what I did is I started collecting data for my commuting uh, in Boston. And so uh, things like a left turn across traffic can be, can be pretty tricky. And so here is a left turn near my house. This is uh, taking my son and his friends to school on a bitter cold day in Boston. And if you look to the right, there are cars as far as the eye can see. There's no traffic light, obviously. And if you look to the left, there are cars coming pretty fast with a mailbox and a tree uh, and occlusion. And the, uh, as a human, we, how do we make those sort of decisions, that sort of go or no-go decision? 
And sometimes it's a negotiation with the other drivers. You sort of wave at them, they nod back. Those are some of the most difficult interactions for humans that it seems very hard to enable uh, for robots. Another example is in the lower left here. This is a place called Coolidge Corner. Let's see if that's going to play. Let's, I'll tell you, let's go to the next one. I'll show you uh, this one. Uh, I'll just play this one. This will work. Um, so here's a poli one police officer directing, directing traffic at one intersection, another police officer at the next. And so at the first intersection, we have a police officer waving me through a red light. And what you'll see at the next intersection is a police officer stopping me at a green light. And so if we're going to turn robots loose in the world as it is today, self-driving vehicles, they're going to have to interact with people. And these are just really challenging problems. Now, today, you could probably detect it's a police officer. But sort of interpreting gestures, that's really hard. Uh, and other challenges, people talk about using a vision-only solution, which I sort of see as a research goal. But we have to acknowledge that there are situations where vision is just really hard. And, and uh, so here, what do you see in this picture? Does anyone see the, the sun, obviously? Anyone see the traffic lights? I need to clean my windshield. Does anyone see the police officer standing just in front of me? Uh, you can just see the, his shadows coming uh, down his legs. So just there, uh, I don't have a pointer, but there, the, uh, trust me, there's a police officer standing right in front of my car in that situation. And, uh, and uh, of course, there's difficult weather. So this is the, the Massa Brad Bridge at MIT uh, in snow. And uh, the, the uh, snow is not difficult just for traction, but also for the, the perceptual problem of masking the world, because if we're going to navigate with a prior map of what the road surface looks like, we need to see the road surface. So in summary, my view is sort of the big challenges going forward, maintaining maps, adverse weather, interacting with people, and then achieving really robust computer vision. And, and as you know, folks will probably talk later today about different levels of autonomy and and, and uh, just very briefly, my big question for level two and level three approaches where there's a handoff from the autonomy to the human is will the humans be ready to take over control? And I think that's a big, big issue. On the other hand, if you aim for level four, level five, a full autonomy with no user controls, then you need to achieve really, really, really high detection rates, uh, you know, perfect essentially with, with very low false alarms. Uh, and that's just really hard. So, it's, so that's the sort of landscape of my career very briefly and what leading into TRI. And with my last five minutes before 10 minutes for questions, I'm going to switch and talk briefly about uh, the sort of TRI context for looking at some of these questions. Um, and so, uh, and I apologize for going so fast. So when, uh, what Gil has uh, given a few uh, sort of talks for the vision of TRI, and I, and I took one of his slides where he talks about the two different modes of autonomy. And this really couples into that previous, conversation, previous slide about the handoff issue, level two, level three, level four. We have this big debate going on now. And I think we need to really think deeply about these questions. So at TRI, we're investigating two different approaches to bringing autonomy into vehicles. Uh, and, and Gil calls these series autonomy versus parallel autonomy. And in series autonomy, you know, or the chauffeur, which was the sort of internal project name for the original Google car project. Uh, in a chauffeur situation, then it, it really is level four, level five, where the, the human is, is not doing, um, you know, the driver's skills are ignored. Uh, and, and, and really, you know, it's, the person is being driven. Uh, and, and I believe that that is important for us to do as a society, for, for the elderly, for the disabled, for the visually impaired. I think we should have the goal of providing mobility to all. But I do think it might take longer for some of these challenging reasons that I talked about. And that's why uh, in, in, we are also pursuing a parallel autonomy solution in which our goal, our aspiration, is to bring some of the autonomy capabilities into human-driven vehicles so that the autonomy can run in parallel uh, as, as, a safe, as a very advanced safety system. So maybe you could think about it as ADAS++, uh, but we think of it in a much more ambitious way of you know, what would it take to have a car that had an autonomy system that could jump in to prevent accidents that otherwise would, would happen under human control. And, and really, that is motivated by, uh, you know, if we think about the challenges with level two and three and the challenges with level four and five, uh, I want to deploy autonomy sooner. I think there are too many lives being lost and injuries due to accidents 
that we need to get the technology into the market sooner. And that's where the, serial, the parallel autonomy comes in, where I think we can take advantage of human driving. The human must pay attention. They're in charge. They're responsible, unless there's a situation that is so dangerous that the car needs to, the autonomy can jump in to take over. And that's some of what we're trying uh, to do. Now, I mentioned before about the, that the sort of vision-only solution and challenges. Um, here's a little example from uh, one of our researchers at TRI, just um, collecting data near our, near our lab. Uh, and here's a, a truck blocking a road, OK? And so if you're familiar with computer vision, the progress has been pretty amazing. And so here, we've taken a, 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 an implementation of, made available on the web by another group uh, just to try it out on the data. Just to, and I, I'm showing this in the spirit of showing you why computer vision is hard. And so, so what do you see? You see a truck, right? Um, uh, let me show you what a computer vision algorithm sees. So I'm going to show a few different views of this. So first is, uh, we actually, our car has multiple cameras. So that's looking forward, looking left, and looking right. It's a little hard to see with the size here. I think I might have a bigger version. But in the middle is the result of what we call a semantic, semantic scene segmentation, where you can see, and that red part there, the person, the, the moving man guy, the computer vision algorithm calls that a, a rider or a person, which is, which is pretty good, really, that it can. But how does a computer know that a picture of a person is not a person? Uh, and the, the precision moving, the text, the computer vision algorithm is calling that a fence. And if you sort of squint your eyes, you can sort of believe how the, the black lettering might look like a fence. And uh, if uh, it did a really great job on that sign, for example, on the left. And so how you actually really understand the world and, and kind of know what you know and do that dynamically is, is a challenge. Um, this is a video. Oh, the video is not going to play. Let's try it. OK, here's an example of what we call it's, it's similar from that sequence. And what, what works well is uh, what we call semantic is, is road segmentation, where you can sort of find the road and find cars. Now, um, so, so in time, interest of time, I'll move on and, and try to move to questions. So just briefly, uh, at Toyota, we also, so here's some technology announced at CES in January. Colleagues in Japan have developed a crowdsourced capability for visual mapping. Um, and, and so the, the goal basically are, uh, is to, uh, to, to use camera images from vehicles to be able to try to make these maps. And if you, if you could somehow uh, leverage off the Toyota fleet, there's a tremendous amount of data that's possible there. And just briefly, I want to mention robotics. Uh, so the Toyota has the um, partner robotics division and the home service robotics. And just very briefly, our, our motivation comes partly from the aging population. This is the, the projection of the, the change in the dem demographics of the US uh, population, the blue line to the red line just in 12 years. In Japan, there's a, a great challenge with the aging population. You can go to something called populationpyramid.net, and you can look at different years in different countries. Uh, and the aging demographics are quite uh, scary. And I think we really can develop robots that can help people age in place, that, that can, can help them in the home. And this is true even in, in China. And so finally, um, before I stop, our academic connections are very strong. So we recently announced uh, you know, a connection with the Open Source Robotics Foundation. Uh, and we're sponsoring with the, H with the uh, partner robots uh, RoboCup 2017. We really want to connect to the developer community. When we want to contribute to open source and use open source. Uh, and then uh, finally, in our collaborations with like MIT, Stanford, and University of Michigan, here's an example of collect that data I showed at the very start. This is what the laser scanner sees. And here's a little example. There's a truck. And you'll see a little circle drawn. If you look in that upper left, that's the view the car has. And imagine if you're a human driver, there's a truck on the other side of the road crossing the double yellow. There's a truck block blocking the bike lane. And that cyclist just appeared out of nowhere, driving on the wrong side of the road. And that's the sort of things that you have to, have to deal with. Um, so uh, all right, so to, to wrap up, as a, as a roboticist, my dream is to create robots that have what I call persistent autonomy, that can, that can learn maps over their lifetimes, uh, even as the world changes. And then to integrate that perception with robust control uh, and planning and, uh, and, and really achieving, can we get guarantees of performance? Uh, can we integrate many different types of map representations? Uh, and, and how do we sort of improve our, our scene understanding? And then ultimately, but interacting with people is, is a huge uh, important part. And so uh, it's a very exciting time to work in this area. I usually show this with, with the young people audiences in, in universities. Uh, if you're 
you know, uh, really the, the uh, not just self-driving, drones, virtual reality, there are mobile devices, there are many, many opportunities in this whole, whole area. Um, and, and then uh, certainly the effect on, on the auto industry is, is stunning to behold, and I, and I think it's, it's really exciting. And we are definitely hiring at Toyota Research Institute, and uh, so please reach out if, if you have any interest. So I'll, so I'll stop there and take questions. Thanks, John. There's a, a microphone at the center if you want to come up and uh, ask your question. We, we also have index cards on the table uh, if you're a little bit shy and just raise your hand and we'll collect them and, and send them up. I know John's eager to uh, address any and all questions, but uh, we did have a, a couple that, uh, that came in earlier and also to play on your, your last uh, slide about uh, some of the partnerships you're doing with some research facilities. Yes. What, What's Toyota's strategy in terms of partnering with other automakers and suppliers? Well, I think that um, Gil has used the term coopetition. You know, like there, there are certainly areas where I feel there are great um, synergies from cooperation. Uh, and so I think uh, I, my personal view, I, not speaking on behalf of all of Toyota by any means, but personally I feel some of the challenges are so great that we're kind of in this together as a society, and if you want to make a difference, we should work together. So I can think of technology areas where, where partnerships make sense, uh, open source software makes sense, sharing data makes sense. And so I, I, I definitely believe Toyota's, uh, TRI is working, willing to talk to, to, to folks from, from any corner of industry. You mentioned some of the key technologies and enabling uh, technologies for autonomy. Is there any uh, hole in Toyota's uh, uh, you know, research right now that you'd like to fill and possibly uh, partner with? I wouldn't describe it as a hole. What I would say is uh, I'm amazed by Toyota's abilities at, at production and at uh, sort of the, the whole mechatronic design of the car. And, but part of our, our mandate, especially like, for example, in the Silicon Valley sort of operation and perspective is to, is to just try to take advantage of all this uh, data, machine learning, and the whole software sort of kind of revolution. It's bringing in the, the that um, uh, really, it's, it's, it's really, our, our mandate is to bring in data and AI into, into the company. Mm. You, you mentioned uh, computer vision as one of the keys too. How does that differ from uh, cameras, current cameras in, in the vehicles? Well, I think certainly cameras and vehicles are ubiquitous. And uh, what, what we need is the ability to process the data from them efficiently and robustly. And so I think what you're seeing in the industry is, is you have the traditional OEMs and, and uh, the tier one suppliers, but you have new players, you know, Mobileye, uh, mm. obviously NVIDIA, that are bringing vision in in very profound ways, like just massive amounts of computation. And so that, I think it's cameras plus the processing plus the connection to the learning systems in the cloud. That's the whole sort of everything coming together is, is the sort of what's really game changing. Uh, being in Detroit, uh, there's often a, a media theme, Detroit versus Silicon Valley. Isn't it more about width and a synergy that can be delivered between re research institutions? Right, I'm a big person for synergy. So for example, I was thrilled that we opened up a lab here in Ann Arbor with the University of Michigan partnership. And, and, it, and I should have mentioned some very important um, uh, team members in our, in our Michigan lab were here at, at Toyota Research Institute North America, Trina. A guy named Michael James has led a, uh, quite a strong autonomous vehicle project there sort of uh, uh, um, for a number of years. And so we actually are, I'm very proud of what our Michigan team has accomplished. And I, hope, I look forward to being able to share that more publicly. With uh, some of the crashes that uh, uh, occurred earlier last year, what responsibility do automakers have to define auto autonomy when talking with uh, customers about features? I think that's a great one. I, one of the things that I like about the parallel autonomy concept, or I'll call it the guardian angel uh, concept, is to make a very clear communication to the customer that your vigilance is required 100% of the time. And I, and I think that as an, as an industry, as a society, we need to uh, sort of really keep the message strong about the driver's number one job. <laughs> and there is no number two job. The number one job is driving. Mm -hmm. and, the, the, uh, and so I, I, I think that messaging to the customers about what the autonomy can and can't do and what the driver's responsibility is is very important. You talked about interaction as one of the, the challenges. 
Are you also doing research uh, into uh, how consumers interact and their willingness and ability to interact? Well, I, I think uh, we're definitely doing research in, in human interaction, the user experience, and the, it's, uh, it's just a vital area for us. And in fact, wearing my MIT hat, I'd love to hire more faculty in that area. I chair, I've been chairing our faculty search for a number of years, and, uh, and they're hard to find. So uh, that, that human-robot interaction piece uh, in this setting is, is absolutely vital. What, what are some of the early, can you share what, what some of the early findings are? Um, I, I think it's too soon to say findings, but just I, I think that we are, you know, uh, trying to connect the, we have research projects underway, for example, with our partners on connecting what's happening, with the, the, the robot's external view of the world with the driver's understanding of the world. So imagine if you can mm -hmm. connect the driver's estimate with what's actually happening um, to, to know if, say, the driver's not seeing something, mm -hmm. for example. And, and in terms of computer vision, another question on that. Uh, what technology, stereo or uh, monocular, uh, do you anticipate moving forward? I think both uh, can play. So if you move a monocular camera through the world, you know, mobile I've shown, you can get really a lot of the benefits of stereo. Uh, on the other hand, you know, like, I, I think we need every tool in the toolbox. You know, there, I can envision situations where this, the depth information from stereo can indeed help. So, so I think it's, it's just many cameras used in many ways. Is it still a, a multi and all sensor approach where you'll see you know, 10 LiDAR, radar cameras? Uh, I think that um, certainly fusing different types of sensor information is gonna be very important still in the short term. And so I, I, I think, you know, I would, aim for you know, capability, if, if you, if you want to aim for capability with multiple sensors and then think later about cost and, and feasibility. But for now, I think we, we need every, every asset we have we should use. Great, and I guess the, the million dollar question, what's Toyota's vision as far as when we'll see level four on the road and what do you anticipate uh, 10 or 15 years from now <coughs> the, the roadscape looking like? Uh, that's probably the one question I can't ask because, you know, I, I can't answer because uh, I view it, here, here's how I'm, I'm posing, you know, in terms of my own personal view on the research, is that I see how great the challenges are. I've been very public about that in my MIT career. And so I think we, we can't predict with certainty when, and that's why I think having a sort of hedging approach of, of so that the goal is that is we need to be mindful that it might take a long time, uh, but it, if uh, we need to figure out ways to use it sooner in, in ways that will help our customers. Well, thanks a lot. Great presentation. My pleasure. <clears throat>